The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready get 30, ready get 20, 20, 20, ready get 20, 20, ready get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. No my hockey mic yeah the fault in me here called and grieve talking uh it's the Tuesday analysis version and I'm joined by regular guest Glenn Kine Kia ora, Glenn Kia ora, Duncan good to be back uh it's a it's quite a like this is this is this is as big as it gets uh in a lot of ways uh Friday out of a clear blue sky I'm not aware that anyone sort of saw this coming uh, there was a, a post to newzealand.googleblog.com, which again is not a place that I think many of us are, are regularly refreshing. We will be now. <laughs> well, so, so if not regularly refreshing, certainly there was a lot of attention for it. I'm sure they sure saw a big traffic spike on Friday. Uh, it was early afternoon that I became aware of it and basically every channel I have was suddenly just like pinging this link back and forth. Uh, it's a post entitled Addressing the Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill. It's maybe seven, 800 words long, and it is uh, attributed to Caroline Rainsford, Google New Zealand's country director. And it, in some respects, right, it, it doesn't tell us something that we didn't already know. But the fact of it being up there and... In black and white, under under Carolyn's um, byline, sort of makes it public in a way that you kind of can't really walk back from here while retaining your your corporate pride, which is a big part of it. It's definitely a posture shift. Yeah. So essentially, look, look, to, to boil it down, it basically it, it sort of ratchets up the the strength of their opposition to the Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill. Just as a very quick recap, this is the bill that was introduced by Willie Jackson and Labor uh, a couple of years ago was when they first sort of started talking about it. National were opposed to it, but uh, about middle of this year sort of switched from a kind of an ambivalence to negative posture to we will find a way to adjust and pass this. Um, and... I'll read the operative paragraph and then we can start to discuss it because it, it, this is the thing that kind of really got everyone's attention. Okay, it reads, We've been transparent with the government that if the bill were to proceed on its current trajectory and become law, we would be forced to make significant changes to our products and news investments. Specifically, we'd be forced to stop linking to news content on Google Search Google News or Discover Services in New Zealand and discontinue our current commercial agreements and ecosystem support within New Zealand news publishers. It's quite big. You know, should that be carried through uh, and be the reality for uh, media in New Zealand? I don't want to put too fine a point on it, Duncan, but you're talking about the potential end of days of journalism uh, in New Zealand, um, you know, should that beca- if that was to become a reality, it does. It does appear that way, right? And we should probably explain why. So, the the first part is um, stop linking to news content on Google Search, Google News, or Discover. Now, search represents roughly, and we I spoke about this on last week's podcast with with Anna Rafati Connell, represents about thirty percent of our traffic. Um, but depending on how they uh, sort of express that, like a lot of the time, if you intend to go to a, a news product, you you might type in 
spinoff. And I don't know, but I'm fairly confident that just means that link would not show up there. You know, like it's 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 a pretty open ended kind of like I mean, because Google is the internet within you know your it has that flat stack of Chrome into search. Often it has an Android operating system. It just owns the whole system. So if it disappears news, it gets pretty hard to find it. Yeah, well, the back end of that paragraph also was really concerning for me because uh, it talked about obviously discontinuing existing commercial agreements, which we should come back and talk about that, um, but also the ecosystem support. And I think that's what you're referring to, Google being um, the masters of vertical integration where the front end, the window of search sitting behind that is really the plumbing of the internet and including uh, how money is made. Um, you know, there are very few digital publishers that aren't using the Google ad stack um, to transact dollars onto that site. So if that ecosystem was to disappear, not only do you have people not clicking on links and not consuming local journalism in New Zealand or not able to find it um, easily the way they once did, um, but also you have uh, revenue dollars falling out of the system that are not easily replaced. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that's kind of quite scary, right? Because, you know, not to harp on the point that we've talked about in this show for, for years now, but news used to have, if not a monopoly, it used to have a huge part of the advertising market, um, but, you know, it was associated with the 6 p.m. news, newspapers, um, uh, news on radio and so on. Right now, advertisers don't necessarily have to, you know, they've got the option of going through news, but they've also got a lot of other options as well. So if the Google ad stack were to stop supporting news and if search were to stop supporting news, a lot of people, a lot of advertisers and a lot of users wouldn't notice a massive amount of difference. So, you know, the... I think that there will be a layer of inconvenience and a layer of, oh, I'm going to have to start to change my habits. Some of them will, but some of them won't. And I think that that's the thing that's kind of scary is like we've spent 20 years building our whole lives around uh, using Google's products across all of our digital lives. So to the point where that behavior is very sticky, you know, once you're logged in with your Google account, everything just sort of works once once you're mm. there. And if you pull something out of that, you make it two or three steps, you know, longer to have to get to that destination, some reasonably large proportion of people just will stop doing that. So that has implications for news. It has implications for democracy too, right? Because you, you have, you will still have information on there, but you'll just only have non-news information. It's, it's kind of staggering. Well, and and you have to assume with uh, you know the discontinuation of existing commercial agreements, you're going to have a loss of jobs um, in Absolutely. journalism, which will be significant. That means less reporting, less coverage. That impacts democracy. Um, to your point, I think the other interesting thing is you know, and I think you make a very good point on you know what happens to consumer behaviour. How does it change? Okay, so. Um, I'm not getting news now via Google. I'm not. I'm not having that surface to me. And the government current position is okay. Well, if Google step away from that, someone like you know Microsoft could step in and provide that service. Okay, but I still want Google to be my primary search engine. I don't want to have to go to Bing or even think about changing my behaviour to do that just for news. So it's not as simple as just saying one might replace the other. Um, at the core is human behaviour here. Um, and what consumers want. And, of course, they want Google to be their preferred choice. That's what they have, you know, grown up with and, and are used to using. So the implications, you know, we, there are so many rabbit holes we could jump down here, but they are vast. Yeah, they they really are. And, and so, I mean, in terms of what, what the, this means, I mean, you've got Google, the – probably the biggest consumer facing technology company in New Zealand I, in terms of on a revenue basis I'm it's always hard to say because of the amount of profit shifting that goes on but um, I think the last I think the last reported number was approximately a billion dollars there was about a billion dollar intercompany transfer between New Zealand back to the back to the mothership so that's a I think a pr pretty good proxy yeah exactly so Microsoft may or may not make a bit more they've been on the ground here for longer they've got a lot of big government and, and corporate contracts and so on but sort of certainly one of the biggest technology companies operating in New Zealand uh, you know 
and the most important from a consumer perspective by far across whatever your device, whatever your ecosystem. Yep. For the vast majority of people, Google might as well be the internet. They have said unequivocally that if you pass this, this is what our response will be. And it's effectively to cave in news within uh, New Zealand uh, in terms of how it relates to the Google ecosystem. Now, that that puts us in this position, right, where I think it's it's, it's no good for anyone. I understand why they've done it. I, I don't necessarily agree with the reasoning, but uh, you know, essentially they say that they, this presents that the bill, if it's passed, it presents them with uncapped risk. Now, the government would say, you're not the target. You're, in fact, the only operator in the news ecosystem that has done deals and is behaving as we want. Google will say, well, we can't, you know, that remains at the discretion of the minister. You know, the current minister might give us assurances, but, you know, that person might be replaced. So, that's that's their position. Whether I agree with it or not, it's you know it's a defensible one, and whether you agree with the approach of almost assuming the worst, assuming the doomsday scenario again, that that's t- TBC. Now, from the government's point of view, they're in a quite a difficult position too, because either they blink and cave, in which case they're they're sort of saying to Google, we don't really have the power to legislate you. And Google, you know, and and or they pass it anyway, and Google caves in news, and they either have to find a new way to support news or to reprimand Google some other way. This is a very, very significant issue, right? Yeah, I mean, this is brinkmanship um, at the highest order. Um, I just want to wear a Google hat for a second, just to add a bit of spice Please to the, <laughs> to this discussion. Um, you know, if you're Google, you're probably a bit frustrated. Um, with the process to date, because you've been the good actor, right? You, um, you know, as as this debate started a few years ago, um, with the international platforms um, effectively shifting ad dollars away from local publishers, um, and the argument behind that was, um, you know, they're not investing in local content, not investing a lot in employment, although Google do employ um, a number of people here. Um, and no taxation in New Zealand, right? So not necessarily an active participant. Google, um, under the implied threat, I guess, of this uh, legislation coming to pass, set about doing negotiations. And they did settle, uh, well, when I say settle, they did agree, um, negotiated agreements with a vast number of publishers. Including the spin-off. Yeah, and they would argue that they have done their bit and no one else has. So that is one of the things at play here. Google are going, well, hang on a minute. We we have negotiated these agreements. We've made a, a significant monetary commitment to New Zealand, to journalism. And what we don't want is to have legislation that suggests or, or, or um, implies a risk that they may have to pay more than what they've committed. The other, I imagine, challenge for Google, um, so, you know, in the US at the moment, um, decision pending on what they are going to do with Google given its market power. Um, That stems from the fact that Google is the predominant search and that it dictates so much behavior and the ecosystem behind it um, is kind of all controlling and the government, you know, whether they will look to break it up in some way. Um, A number of decisions, kind of antitrust type things happening with Google around the world what they won't be wanting is any sort of decision from New Zealand that has the potential to set a precedent for other governments to follow suit um, around the world. So from Google perspective, you can kind of understand it. You know, I've we've, we've played well, we've contributed. I genuinely believe that Google do want the best for journalism in New Zealand. And I certainly know my historical dealings with them, and I'm sure yours too, they genuinely do want to see innovation come out of the journalism sector in New Zealand because they see that also as being good for um, their uh, broader broader community. Um, but that's probably largely the, the, the Google side of the argument here. Um, the government argument, you're quite right. So if you're a local publisher, you want not just Google, you want, um, you know, you want Meta, you want Microsoft, you want TikTok, you want the other players at the table. Um, you want everyone contributing who's monetizing off the back of that content. Um, it, uh, you know, we would argue inappropriately. Um, 
uh, you want uh, a government to have a very strong line on this. And I think to answer your question, um, we don't want the government to blink. We want the government to stay strong, but we also want the government to stay in unison um, and in step with the local media publishers. It should be a united front. It should be a united force on terms of how they approach and respond to this. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, like, like you said, I, I do have a lot of sympathy for Google in the sense that they... They, there's probably the strongest case that they should be contributing out of everyone. I think there's a case for against all of the the kind mm. of platforms in different ways, which would take hours to go into. But but the, the the most sort of obvious, I think, is is against Google for a variety of reasons. That said, they are, as you say, they they're the adults in the room. But it's strange to me that they are both paying. The, the, they are you know the the largest. And in some ways, only sort of significant financial contributor to the to New Zealand, New Zealand, but also leading the charge against the legislation. So if you're Meta, which uh, you know TikTok, um, Microsoft through LinkedIn and Bing, you're absolutely in scope for this. Um, but you're, they're all just kind of from a public relations perspective, hanging back in the cut, mm -hmm. letting Google both pay the price <laughs> and lead the conversation, which is uh, you know somewhat curious. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, senior writer at The Spin-Off. We're huge fans of local television here, and for one night only, we want to celebrate some of our all-time faves. Join me, Kura Forrester, Rhiannon McCall, and fellow Spin-Off writers at Q Theatre on October 31st. That's right, Halloween. Together, we'll unearth some beloved TV gems and argue for their place in our pop culture history. Tickets are on sale now at thespinoff.co.nz forward slash events. What I'd like to talk about now is, is you know, because as you say, as we sort of discussed earlier, right now we're in this brinkmanship situation where the two scenarios sketch, either Google wins the argument and we lose our sovereignty or the government holds um, firm and we lose news. There's it's, the, both of those are terrible outcomes. Is there a less terrible one in between? And that's where, you know, one thing which I think we should look hard at is is what I'm, I've been sort of calling privately, and we'll I'll write about this this week. Is this, this what we'd call the the Canadian compromise? Because the. the I think that Google could. They don't like this legislation. They have essentially, you know, advocated for a different. Um, more mechanistic form yep. of, a, of a levy, which I think is really interesting. It's just hard to restart a process which has been running for, for years. But if you have to go down this path, you know, is there a way that you can essentially carve Google out? And in Canada, they, the, the government and Google reached a compromise where they, they named a figure. Over there it was 100 million Canadian that would be distributed to, to kind of key news sources. And in return... Google was literally written into legislation as it is not applying to them essentially because of this agreement which had been reached at the side. Now, that that's not a desirable like if you're if you're a you know a, a policy person who likes to draft legislation that is kind of clean and pure. This is the last thing that you want. But we live in a, an expedient society, and there's plenty of examples over the years of us having to kind of make law which is not ideal in the interest of preserving our kind of chewing gum, paper clips, and, and uh, number eight wire sort of society um, structure along the way. What, what do you think about that as an idea? Do you think it's got legs? Uh, well, I like the idea and I like the certainty that it provides both the publishers um, and actually the certainty it provides Google um, in, in that example. The challenge for the government is can you have a set of rules or can you introduce a set of rules um, where uh, Google are effectively exempt with, a, with a, a named monetary figure and as you've pointed out, the rest of the international publishers are a long way, well, appear to be anyway, publicly um, 
unsure on their positions on, you know, would they contribute to the legislation as it is or would they want to go down a similar route. Um, in a time, in a, at a time where I think um, expedience is important, um, our industry is in trouble. Um, but this is the thing, right? Yeah. Like, it, it's not like this is happening in peacetime yep. when everyone's going along fine. The fact, And Google will be aware of that. I don't know whether it's positive or negative that they have such power yep. right now. But certainly this isn't, you know, the... Right now, as we speak, TVNZ are, are having you know discussions about mm -hmm. um, the future of their newsrooms. There are new, more jobs going to go. Uh, you know, last week there were um, restructure announced and stuff. This feels like baked in every six months. What's going to be happening with news? And that's with Google in the market. Yes, yeah, and I think so. Again, I go back to the speed with which they can execute this. The certainty that they can put into the legislation for both sides is going to be really important um, to the conversation. I also would hate to think, uh, given the timely need for a solution, that our government would look to. Um, do something in isolation of the rest of the world. I think you only need to look to the rest of the world to see what's working, what's not. Um, and Canada seems to be um, the most pragmatic um, solution. We saw what happened in Australia and we, and we continue to watch what's happening in Australia. Um, some success, yes, a lot of money that did flow early days into that negotiation, but that was on the back of a very hard line um, from the from the government over there. Um, but it subsequently, you know, you you saw what happened with Meta over there. They just said, "Not, we're not going to participate now." Um, yeah, and and that's you know th that's the sort of next step, and I think that's part of what's driving Google's position is like we've this you've got you've made the decision to make your legislation mirror Australia's. Well, let's look over in Australia. Google has gone back to the table and is renegotiating. I think it's, it's trying to pay less than it was, mm -hmm. but but they're still they're negotiating in good faith. Meta's just said we're we're not we're not doing this, and so far the Albanese government hasn't figured out what it's going to do next. And complicated by the fact that it's got an election kind of hurtling at it. But mm -hmm. I mean, that that is the sort of the natural next step is we know that it's not like Meta are going to go, oh, you passed the legislation, here we are, ready right. to, to negotiate. They're, they're a pretty uh, renegade kind of a, a business and they, they're going to steer you down. Mm. And I think the other reason we need to see the government regulate in this space quickly um, is knocking down the door very, very quickly um, is AI. Um, and you've got you know a lot of the major... Um, tech companies um, themselves that are, um, you know, architects of um, this kind of new front of AI, generative AI that's coming at us, they, they themselves are calling for regulation and legislation before this gets out of hand. And the reason I raise this, Duncan, is that, um, you know, I would argue that, uh, you know, ChatGPT, for example, have already scraped every piece of data that every news publisher in New Zealand has ever produced, and it already exists. Um, if value continues to seep out of the system without fair payment and without, um, uh, you know, the right value exchange, um, journalism will just continue to be in deeper and deeper trouble. Yeah, and and and, and honestly, almost no matter what, it feels that way. Um, I mean. OpenAI has, uh, and, and you know, a few others like Perplexity have made deals with various publishers, and I can see that continuing to happen. In some ways, that's a good sort of precedent to to set. Um, but the fact that there has been this, you know, complete digestion of every written word um, on the internet, regardless of what the kind of implied or actual terms of use are, um, you know, it, it just sort of shows where the the, the power is in, in terms of the, the society we've we've let be built, absent regulation. What do you think? So uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you think this gets solved amicably or do you think we um, continue with brinkmanship? I, if I had to guess, I'd say it gets solved. I, I think um, this government doesn't have the greatest relationship with media, but it does have an interest in I, I think it's already seen as you know better than anyone um, news hub disappear this year I think if this if, if the Google if they, if they push through the legislation without compromise and Google do what they say they're going to do and I, I don't believe that they're bluffing I think that they will do that um, then you'll absolutely see more publishers uh, disappear and mass job losses, and you'll see them very quickly. 
And so, you know, I, I think that there is a there's a good reason to think that, you know, whether it's the Canadian compromise or, or, or something else kind of get gets pushed through. Um yeah, I I, I do. The the government has suggested that um, in Shane Curry's article this morning where he's OIA'd um, some internal documents there that there's 30 to 50 million as a sort of target number the government would like to have on the table from the international platforms. It's interesting, right? Like that's a, that's a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's proportional to what uh, was achieved with the Meta and Google deals out of Australia in the first round. Mm -hmm you know, somewhere in that 30 to 50 range. Um, but, into, you know, Google's the only one in the market right now. Uh, my best guess is that they're putting around $10 million yep. into the local market. That's that's just based on sort of asking around and, do, and doing some kind of back of the envelope maths. But if that's true, then you're either asking Google to put in more, which based on this is, is very unlikely, or you're asking the balance of the market to put in somewhere between 20 and 40 million. That seems on any basis incredibly unlikely. So, yeah. So let's reverse that. Um, if you were, uh, and you are, uh, an employer of um, you know journalists um, and you run a digital publishing site, if that estimated, and let's call it a ballpark, 10 to 12 million, if that was to disappear from the New Zealand market, what do you anticipate the impact on jobs would be? How many jobs do you think would go from journalism? I think if you think about the the, the Google deals plus the, the proportion of the digital news market, which is driven by Google's existence here, I would guess somewhere between 150 and 200 jobs would go in short order. Um, and then beyond that, you'd just have probably a faster erosion. Mm. Um, yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, I think that's about right. Um, I think some will suffer more, some potentially can't even continue uh, and um, – uh, you know, will we'll cease to exist actually, uh, particularly when the advertising market's as difficult as it is right now, taking away the Google funding would be dire. Um, but equally, to paint a positive view, um, should the government strike a deal and get that sort of money on the table, um, I think it, it, it does wonderful things uh, for the sector. It allows innovation to come in, it allows people to speed up their digital transformations. Um, it's an inherently good thing if the government can be successful with this. Yeah, that, that's why this feels so delicately poised. Like I think it's it's no exaggeration to say that if the government's you know thirty to fifty number turns out to be correct, you see the most positive impact to journalism than we've probably mm -hmm. ever had in terms of a, a single stroke of a pen. E if Equally, if you see Google go through with what they're uh, saying they might do, you'll have this sort of single worst one-time impact. Um, so, yeah, it's quite, it's quite delicately poised. Would you, um, you know, any messages for the CEOs of the news publishers out there? I mean, the the... The natural thing, right, is that whatever our individual views might be, that we sort of that that they should align around a particular position. It's in everyone's interests to cobble together some kind of a compromise. I think, uh, and while there might be divergent views, while some might think, well, actually, let's really find out if they are. So, you know, whether, whether it is brinkmanship, some people might genuinely be curious about what lies on the other side of that. Um, I, I, if you could run a controlled experiment or, or A-B <laughs> test that I would be too, but I think the, but given the stage we're at right now and the, and the likelihood of the government kind of stepping in to, to do something, um, you know, of, of any substance to kind of counter it, I think it's, uh, it is too risky, but... We shall see. I think there's never been a bigger rallying call for our sector to bring the CEOs together domestically. Um, you know, remember remember what's at stake here uh, if this goes wrong. Um, and not only to unite and collaborate, but also um, understand how to support the government and their actions. Um, I think absolutely critical. Yeah, agree, agree. Um, let's do a quick hit on Staff Audio. 
um, which basically was their sort of podcast division um, launched by with some fanfare by by Nadia Tolich a, a couple of years ago. Likes of Newsable, uh, you know, Tova. Um, you know, you've you've had a, a number of uh, sort of uh, episodic podcasts as as well as the the ongoing streams. They've essentially decided to disestablish that, um, build a combined audio video team under a single leader, and um, and while they're not stopping making audio products, those will largely be audio versions of shows that exist in video. What, what do you think of the decision? Um, not surprised, um, and I think particularly on the back of the decision to um, produce the um, three news bulletin. I think they are actively uh, progressing a video-first digital strategy, and I think um, they understand that they have the talent um, in the portfolio to really drive that. I think you know what they've done with Patty um, is fantastic. Um, and I think a lot of the opportunity they have now is to move into that video first storytelling in short form, short form, not being by the way, um, what they had in terms of, and I just forget what they call it, um, stuff short, stuff shorts. Yeah. Um, but I mean their ability to use the talent to go deeper on a story, build out a story in video, um, give footage that might not be available on free news, um, take, you know, a stuff long form piece and add um, opinion analysis and talent to that. Um, I think there's a place for that in New Zealand. It doesn't exist yet, and I think they are aggressively going after it, as I suspect, by the way, <laughs> are their competitors um, at the Herald. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Right? Like there's there's this part of you that goes, what must it be like to work at stuff right now? Just to, the, the persistent waves of enormous change that kind of convulse the organisation and – and I really feel for them, um, for people who've who've had their kind of working lives just sort of so regularly disrupted, let alone those that, that have been restructured and had to leave as a result. At the same time, I think given the volume of staff they've hired and the skill set of those staff and where, where revenue lies, uh, you know, and a lot of this is down to what do media agencies want to buy? It's video inventory. Like you can't, you might think that there should be a bigger market for audio and there should be a bigger market for um, advertising which sits alongside tech stories and, and you know, that these things are mispriced. I think all of those things, but you kind of don't really get to dictate terms. Certainly not the spin-off level, not really at stuff either. So in some respects, I think that the strategic move is probably the correct one, and that it you know it it is it should be viewed as you say as connected to the that sort of big bang of volume and opportunity and talent that they got when they took on three news, and it's just a sort of a logical continuation of that strategy. Yeah, that's right. And the market is the market. I don't think stuff will permanently exit audio. I think there will always be a space, and they have some very good podcasts, and I think they will continue to find a way. Um, but I do think, you know, the market is the market. Video dollars um, sit at the top of the funnel in terms of, you know, cost per thousand of what um, media companies are able to bring into their businesses. Um, stuff are going after that. And I think, I suspect, and this is absolutely speculation, but that very fact may play a role in what we see in the TVNZ restructure news coming out um, over the following days. So we will, uh, I, I should say one, one more thing on stuff. Is it, the end of Stuff Audio doesn't, as, as you just alluded to, it doesn't mean the end of their podcasts. I think they, they remain committed to the likes of Tova. Mm. It just means that they will be video associated with it and they'll sit inside a single yep. division rather than um, being separated out. But yeah, as, as you say, this is, we're going through another sort of convulsive period of tumult in New Zealand media. By this afternoon, we should have a lot more information about um, what's what's happening in TVNZ. There's been speculation that the likes of Re and, and One News will be uh, .coded in Z. You know, the, the website will be impacted by that. But um, as of now, that, that's speculation is all it is. Um, we'll be back to discuss it next week. Thanks so much for, for coming on the fold today, Glenn. Thanks, Duncan. Good to be here.
Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.